Welcome to Manny's Super Civic Cyber Conversations. It's seven o'clock and I and the controller are both having a beer. You can show your beer. There you go. I think that's a beer. Or maybe it's like a- It's a beer. It's a beer. <laughs> He's a beer drinker, everyone. Um, if my internet cuts out at any time, we're gonna keep going. Ben is gonna share his screen and do the slideshow. Real quick, Manny's is a small business in San Francisco. We had to shut down. We're a civic space uh, because of the uh, shelter in place order. But we, are, we, we think of ourselves as providing a community service, this programming. And so we've been very, very honored that folks from all over the country have been uh, offering up their time to give the community the information and the inspiration and the engagement that they need to get through this. So thank you very much to all of you for tuning in. And thank you to Ben Rosenfield, the San Francisco city controller, the person who manages our budget, um, for giving us a sense of how COVID-19 is affecting city finances and the city budget. I just wanna say two quick things. If you have a question for Ben, or you're not gonna have a question for me, but let's say you have a question for me, you probably don't. You got a question for Ben. Type the question in the Q&A box. We're gonna to get to questions afterwards, after he makes his presentation. If you have a question about a specific slide, write the slide number in your question so we can refer back to that slide, okay? Because we're gonna do uh, slides at the end. Second, make sure to tag us at Welcome to Manny's. And let's just get right into it. Ben, you ready? Sure. All right, let's, let's do it. Okay. It looks good. Just oh, perfect. Great. All right. I figured this out after a month. Great. So. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm here today to talk a little bit about the city's budget and financial challenges looking ahead. I know you had uh, Ted Egan, the city's chief economist, on just a couple days ago. So this is kind of the reflection of that economic news here on what it means for the city's finances. And uh, so I, I thought I would start briefly with, and this will be my only reused slide from Ted, I promise, um, but just a bit of economic context for this moment. Um, and it really is an unprecedented one. Uh, this is a slide for, uh, for folks that can see it um, that charts just the run up in growth in jobs we saw in the US during the last 10 years. So the recovery period after the last recession, that's the blue line. And you can see that during that 10 year period, we added about 25 million jobs in the US. Um, and um, that's the longest period of US economic expansion in, in modern history. Um, and you can see at the bottom, the, the orange bar is the number of unemployment claims coming in um, every, every, every month for that 10 year period. And you can see it's kind of a very boring, bumpy line at the bottom of the chart until the far right. And that far right line represents really our last, last month. That represents March and a couple days of April. And in that one month period, we had as many people file unemployment claims in that month as gained jobs in the previous 10 years. And we expect that that, that line's gonna continue growing in the US, unfortunately, um, in, in, in April um, and likely, likely well into May. Um, so just a, an unprecedented shock uh, to the US economy, to the world economy, and that's played out here locally as well. Um, so part of what my office does is is we forecast what 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 we expect to happen to the San Francisco economy and then how that's going to roll through the city's finances. Um, and usually we have a single projection. Um, we have a, a reasonable sense of what's going on in the world. We can make reasonable estimates about 12 months and 24 months ahead um, and what's likely to occur. That's obviously not the moment we're in. So at the moment we're using uh, and we did this at the end of March. Um, two scenarios. And a, a lot of what's going on at the moment is, is related to not just, uh, it's, it's really uncertainty about what's going on from a health perspective and for the public health emergency and how that's going to play out in months ahead. And then obviously how that'll translate into the economics and financials. Um, so we're using two scenarios at the moment, and these were our March scenarios. One is of a more limited impact scenario where we have really severe losses here in San Francisco and in the US, and we have a very quick recovery that begins. Ted talked a lot about this uh, earlier this week. 
um, and we really have a quick recovery that is well underway by the end of 2020. Kind of what we call a V-shaped recession playing out here locally. Um, the second scenario is, is a more extended one where losses are more, the health impacts are more severe, shelter in place stays in place for longer, recovery looks slower, and so we see more severe losses for six months, and then a recovery begins. And it's kind of a halting recovery that, that you know, really extends through 2021 and beyond. Can I ask so you a question on this, Ben? Yeah, please. So you did these projections in late March. It's mid-April. Do you feel like everything that's happened in the last couple of weeks are making you feel like it's going to be one scenario versus the other more likely? Yeah, I'm... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a betting man, but um, I would, I, I'm more and more pessimistic about where we are at the moment in terms of the limited versus extended scenario here, at least as it relates to San Francisco's impacts. Okay. So I think the chances of a, of a very quick snapback and shelter in place lifts and magically everyone returns to economic behaviors that were in place um, that we were all performing in February, uh, I, I think increasingly that seems unlikely to me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a public health expert, and a lot of this drives off of what will happen from a public health perspective, but um, I think we were, were you know, increasingly I'm, I'm leaning towards the extended, extended scenario here. Okay. Um, okay. And I should say that I, I don't think that the extended scenario that I'm going to talk through here a little bit and what it means financially is the worst case scenario. Um, I do think there you can you can easily draw and you can you know I'm I'm like many other people are following academic modeling and discussions uh, about what's to come from a public health perspective. You can easily draw scenarios from a public health perspective that are worse than what we what sits under our extended scenario. Um, ones where this the reopening of the economy in the U.S. and around the world and here in San Francisco is slower. And that could either be because governments are mandating slower reopening or simply because governments told us that it's okay to go out again and people are naturally nervous about that. And so you can easily draw, you know, I think there are worst case scenarios here where the behavioral impacts on things like air travel and convention business and people returning to restaurants and kind of resuming the normal economic cycle that was sitting under all of our finances in January, it could take, it could, I think you could see a world where that takes much longer. Um, and then of course, we have this possibility, which we've all read about, that um, you're gonna have periodic outbreaks going forward until, until there is a, is, is a cure. Um, and those could be small and the government, governments can prepare and minimize them, but you could have this kind of sparks and, and little fires that need to be put out for the next year or two years that could, could if that occurs, the, the, the picture will be worse than what I'm talking through here. Okay, I don't like this slide, let's keep going. Yeah, sorry, Manny. Um, so in terms of how the city is gonna feel this impacts, we're gonna feel it some things right away and we're already feeling them in a really profound way and then others that are gonna be more delayed. So we have a number of taxes that are sit under a lot of our public services here in San Francisco that are paid monthly and um, and in many cases, they're paid by parts of the economy that have clearly been almost immediately uh, shut down. So hotel taxes, for example, are paid on a monthly basis. We know that um, the hospitality industry in San Francisco and everywhere in the world has really evaporated overnight. Um, occupancy rates in San Francisco hotels that were at you know 85 percent uh, in February. Uh, ended March with occupancy rates at 5%. And that was for hotels that hadn't closed. Um, sales tax, parking tax, a lot of these kind of uh, taxes that hit the part of the, that come from the part of the economy that are most impacted and are paid timely and monthly, we're going to, we're seeing those losses already. And so we're going to feel those in the current year. And then you have other taxes that are related to kind of economic dislocation that's occurring. So transfer taxes that are paid on commercial properties trading hands, interest earnings that the city makes on money we have invested. Um, we're seeing those losses right away as well. So we're gonna have sizable current year losses. Um, and then unfortunately, 
uh, or fortunately, I guess, um, we're going to see more losses coming next fiscal year. And so the city's fiscal year starts on July 1. And so that first section isn't really in the next three months. We're going to feel those losses very acutely, and they'll continue into next year. But then next year, the year starting after July 1, we'll probably start to feel the impacts of our two largest tax revenues. Um, property tax and business tax are both paid basically once a year or twice a year. And losses that people are feeling today are not going to translate into tax revenues until next fiscal year. So it's like a so, delayed, it's like a delayed um, bite. Yep, yep. So there's problems we have immediately, and there's problems to come. Um, um, the other, the other thing that's gonna, that's kind of affecting the city's financials really profoundly here is that uh, the city has tremendous costs that we're incurring in order to respond to this public health crisis. Um, we have, and that's a little bit different than the last couple of recessions we've had. Um, but the city is spending a, a very large amount of money on hospital and public health, on preparing for surges into our medical systems, on um, leasing up hotels to provide opportunities for people that can't self-quarantine in place, um, buying huge amounts of PPE um, and medical supplies. Um, and all the other associated costs from a local government that's trying to respond to the public health emergency. So we've got a lot of costs that we're incurring even while we're losing all of this revenue. Do you have a ballpark for how much it's costing the city, roughly? We're working on ranging that cost. It really is hard to pin down because it's related to how the, the public health emergency plays through the world. And if it's more severe, it's going to be more cost and less severe, less cost. But to give you a sense, um, like one of the big cost buckets at the moment is is leasing up hotels. Right. And the city's doing a lot of leasing up of hotels in the city, and that's to provide opportunities for people that are COVID positive or under investigation that need to be pulled out of our hospitals and can't can shelter in place or be cared for in their homes or or the homeless, uh, either from the street or from shelters. Um, we we current you know. We're likely to lease the, the targets are seven thousand to eight thousand hotel hotel units in the city to lease up. If we lease up that number of units in the city, um, and we're, when we're successful in getting there, that's something like a hundred million dollars for the next three months, maybe a little bit more. And that's just one of many different cost items that we're for all three months or per month. For all three months. Okay, got it. And that's after some assumptions about how the feds and others are, will, will help us offset that cost. Okay, got it. <clears throat> um, Another not fun slide, yeesh. Sorry, it's kind it's of like, a theme, gonna, it's kind of a theme a for me tonight, unicorn man. Or something at the end of this goddamn presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about how your bidet order is going. How do you know about my bidet order? <laughs> I haven't done it yet, they're very expensive. Okay. Um, so if we take the, then this is our March scenario, if we take those numbers, those scenarios, the limited and the extended, and we play it through the, the forecast, and this is for the current, this next three months is 1920, and then the next two years, which are the two years that the mayor and the board have to balance a budget for here in coming months, we're talking really about $720 million to $1.3 billion in revenue losses was our March estimate. Um, and you can see the shape of that. Again, we have some losses in 1920, but actually the problem gets worse next year when property tax and business taxes catch up with us. And then we need to, to layer that, layer onto that the fact that walking into all of this, despite the fact that we're, we were in good times and have been in good times until as recently as February, the city had a modest projected shortfall for the two years ahead, regardless of about 400 million over the two years. And so when we put that math together, $400 million pre-existing deficit, additional revenue losses during this 27 month period of about a billion dollars, we're left with somewhere between a 1.1 and $1.7 billion problem. So that's, where, that's where that famous number now comes from, I see. That's where that, and, and it will be outdated here shortly. Um, you know, the, the world's changing a lot. We're spending a lot of time every day 
uh, reading the tea leaves, seeing what's going on with taxes and local businesses. Wow. Um, and we're going to be updating all these numbers actually in about two weeks Got it. Uh, with, with fresh ones. Got it. So I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> um, so a bit about the city's budget. At, you know, we have about a $12 billion budget here in San Francisco, um, which puts us somewhere between like Latvia and Rhode Island um, in terms of budget size. Um, about half of that budget is the general fund. And that's that blue, the blue uh, slice of pie here. Um, that's really what I was just talking about. That's where most taxes flow. Um, and that's where the mayor and the board really make discretionary choices about spending tax dollars on rec and park and police service and fire and public health and human service. A lot of the things we think of as, as our local government services, but the city has a, a we're, we're uniquely consolidated government. So we have a lot of other, what we call enterprise enterprises here in the city that are outside of the general fund. And those are on the left side. And that makes, that's, that's our airport, that's our port. We have a water system and a utility that serves not just San Francisco, but most of the Bay Area. Um, and we have a transit system, the MTA. Um, is money that's going out or money that comes into the city? These are, this is the money going out. This is what we're- Why are this we is, paying a billion dollars to the airport? Oh, sorry. The, air, the airport is a billion dollar part of our local government. The airport spends about a billion dollars a year to operate SFO. And we're paying for that? No, the the left side of the pie here, these they've all got their own funding sources. So oh, airport airport landing. So these are not tax dollars on the left side. Okay. I'm like so right? someone else should pay for the airport. Um so the airport pays for itself, our utilities are paid for by by water and power and okay. sewer charges that we all pay. The transit system has different uh, set of revenues. Um so this is the other non-general fund part of the budget. And I think my point here is only that I just talked through the problem on the right side, but there's a lot of problems on the left side of this chart as well. Um, obviously this is a, not the right time of, of, the, of, of, of the cycle to be in the airport business. Um, huge, huge reductions in landings at SFO, um, huge reductions in their revenues. Um, I think you have days at the moment at SFO where you have fewer than 10 international flights leaving the airport on a given day, just to give wow. a sense of how much that business is contracted. And um, I just talked to Joe Alessandro from SF Travel and he said that there are no direct flights to Europe from San Francisco right now. Yeah, hmm. yeah. There's a, there's a few flights to Canada, a few to Mexico, I think a few to Asia, none to, none to Europe um, at the moment. The so that, is, when it comes to aid from the federal government, do you feel like the left side of the pie chart is a lot more likely to receive aid than the right side? Yeah, it's an interesting. Actually, the federal money flows through a lot of a lot of of our operations on both the left and right side. It's about one at one of every five dollars we spend comes from either D.C. or Sacramento. Okay. Um, and so it's really important money for the airport. It's really important money for transit. That federal money sits under a lot of our healthcare system here in the city, which right. is on the right side of the chart. And so federal federal money is is critically important always, and it's especially important right now. Got it. Um, and, um, it's good we have such a great president administering it. <laughs> um, we have a great speaker that is that is helping greatly every day at the moment. That we do. That we do. Um, but. You know, we've gone through economic cycles where the, the general fund really feels the economic pain uh, from a recession. This time, we're going to feel the pain on both sides of this pie because the airport is, is going to be suffering huge losses. Our transit system, which is heavily dependent on fare revenue, on parking tickets and parking meters, and on federal assistance, is suffering huge losses. Our utility, even, is, is feeling pain from. You know, you can imagine fewer commercial customers at the moment consuming yep. water, consuming sewer, yep. et cetera. Talk to so Harlan this, about that. We talked to Harlan about that yesterday. Yeah, so so at least for the 23 years I've been doing, working on the city's budget, this, this is going to be kind of a, a bigger event in terms of its impacts on all parts of our operations. Um, 
maybe I should have ended with this slide, but I didn't. But th these are things that are going to help. Um, and you know, if I wanted to make you a bit happier, Manny, I probably would have ended with this one today. But um, there are things that will be better for us this time than the last couple cycles. Um, uh, first of all, and federal assistance is going to help cover a lot of the city's emergency response costs right now. I mean, the federal government has really responded with huge stimulus spending, even for what they've done to date, and there's talk about more. Um, and that's going to help with a lot of the emergency response costs we're incurring for leasing up hotels, with uh, buying equipment for our hospitals, with staffing up for medical surge. Um, it's going to help with our transit agency. There's been a lot of money flowing for airports. So that's going to help. But on the general fund side, at least, at, at least thus far, it's, it's entirely focused on helping us pay for things related to the emergency response. And it's not going to None, none of those dollars at the moment are earmarked to help offset those revenue losses I talked about earlier. So it's gonna help with part of the picture, but not the rest. Um, we're in much better financial condition than we were in either of the last two recessions um, entering them. Our reserve position is much better. Um, we have reserves on hand that are gonna soften the impact of a lot of this, but not cover it. Um, and a lot of that was because of lessons learned after the 2008 recession, uh, where the voters adopted a set of measures to force the city to take a longer view of our finances and to save more when times are good. Well, we have, and now that money will get spent when times are bad. And so we have about 590 million in rainy day reserves that'll help. Um, may, the, this mayor, this board, and the prior ones have done a good job of spending more money during better times on one-time purposes like capital, road repair, facilities maintenance, those sorts of discretionary programs that can grow when times are good and then shrink when times are bad. And so we're, we're in better shape on that front. Um, but I think kind of transitioning to bad news, um, these are only gonna soften the blow. There's, there's no view of this recession that we're looking at at the moment where these strategies alone are gonna come close to carrying us through it. Harder choices are gonna remain. Okay, my only question on this slide is like, is how much of the rainy day fund do you think you're gonna take out to deal with the short term and medium term effects of this? Cause like, it's a rainy day fund for a reason. We wanna use it, but also it's probably gonna rain for a little while. So how much are you thinking about using it? Yeah, the, the, the city's primary reserve, we have two basically rainy day reserves and they're really, they're structured by law in a way that they have to be drawn over time. We, we know from experience that recessions don't turn on and off and these financial impacts can take time to, to bridge. And so those reserves are gonna get drawn really over the next three years. Okay, but don't you think because this recession is so unique in that it was basically created by us, couldn't it also be unique in that it gets uncreated by us very quickly? Right? Yeah, I think it's that's the V-shaped recession we talked about a little bit earlier, that you really see a quick snap down and then you see a quick snap back. Um, if we find that and we think that that's likely, we could, we could spend our reserves more quickly. Um, I think that would be a risk given what we know today because there's so much downside risk looking ahead. Um, I think the chance of a quick V-shaped recession um, uh, are, are are diminishing and I think if we if we find the worst case scenario is we spend all of our reserves to hold ourselves together we deplete them and we find the world is worse than what worse than what we thought right. 12 months from now and then you have to make much harder choices to get yourself through whatever's after got it okay um, things that'll hurt um, you know, as I said earlier, unlike the last couple of recessions, in this one, we're gonna face not only significantly diminished revenue, but we have very significant new emergency spending requirements that are needed by local government and needed by the state at the moment to kind of carry society through this. Um, we talked about some of those in the shorter term, but there are gonna be those costs that sit after we come out of this as well. I mean, we need to be, be doing more at a local level in the state tracing cases. We need to be able to better and quickly manage 
manage smaller outbreaks as they occur. We, um, you know, th there's a host of new costs that are going to be coming here. So we're facing this pressure on both sides, both revenue and expense. Um, another another thing that's going to hurt this time, the losses are happening so fast. Um, the 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 financial losses, the economic losses here are out of proportion to anything that's ever been felt before in modern U.S. history, and certainly here in San Francisco. Um, you know, I never would have thought that we would lose, say, three hundred million dollars in a in 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 the middle of a fiscal year. We're going to lose that this quarter, um, and we're going to lose a hundred million dollars in hotel tax in two and a half months. Um, it doesn't leave you as much time to plan because the last couple of recessions we've seen that we're entering them and it gives you time to slow down and begin to adjust. We just don't have that here. It happened so Funny, You and I talked about this very moment when you came to Manny's. I remember it so well. You said, Manny, it's been the law. I asked you this, I said, do you think a recession's coming? And you said, well, if history teaches us anything, we have never had this much sustained economic growth so it does seem more likely than not that some event will happen that will be recession-like. And we sat there and we kind of, we didn't blow it off, but here we are a couple months later and we're talking about it and it's kind of crazy. I, you know, I'm as shocked by any of this as anyone is in terms of the speed and rapidity and what's occurred in our world. Um, um, but if history teaches us anything, it's that these cycles happen. And, and this one happened sooner than I expected it to, but it has. Um, and, and now we need to work through it. Um, another thing that I think is going to hurt this time or just be different than the last few uh, here locally is just the level of uncertainty. I mean, we talked a little bit about how do you, how do you think about what a quick snapback looks like financially? while you also plan for the possibility that this might be several years of this, not, not of the state we're in currently, but of, of, of really significant financial losses. And so much of it hinges, hinges around the shape of this health crisis that we know so little about still and how it's gonna play out um, in terms of its social and economic impacts and what that means for how the city and state and the federal government need to respond and then what the financial impacts are to the city that that meters how much we can do and what we can do, and so that that uncertainty at the at the moment about what the future holds is is higher than anything I've seen before, um, and I think that uncertainty is likely to persist well through through 2020 and beyond, and so we're dealing with preparing budgets in an environment where we don't know what next week holds or next month holds, let alone next year holds. Um, and then I'll end with, you know, and this is really, I'm sorry to do this, is just, I do think, as we talked about a little bit earlier, I think our March projections are likely to get worse. Um, when we update these forecasts uh, in early May, I think the financial impacts for the city are gonna look worse than what I thought they did. Um, as we get new information, as we understand more about um, what's going on economically and financially here locally. And with that terrible news, um, I'll quickly end with just a, a little bit of the budget process. The city has delayed its budget process this year for the first time and that I'm aware of. Um, the mayor has kind of extraordinary powers during emergencies and she can, she has changed the budget process in a way that I think gives us a little bit more time to think about all of this. We're gonna be working on an updated forecast of all of this. The mayor needs to rebalance the current year budget and work with the board of supervisors to get that done. Um, and then in August, really, you're going to see a proposed budget from the mayor to bridge the shortfalls for the next two fiscal years. Um, and those will be hard choices. Um, and there'll be a lot more to come on that in June and July this year, August. And then the board, the board of supervisors picks up that budget in August and September prior to adopting a final one um, by October 1st. And I think that's gonna kick off just a cycle, not of being done with the budget, but of being done with a budget and needing to monitor and adjust it as we know more about what the world and the future holds for us. You done yet? Yeah, sorry. Okay. I'm done.
let's, uh, no, I'm kidding. You can unshare your screen. Obviously we knew that this was going to be a tough conversation. Um, but you know, and I think it's important. It's important for the public, the San Franciscans to know what's really happening here. Um, and you know, what's at stake. So, you know, thank you for presenting it. I just have a couple quick questions and then folks, if you have questions for Ben, type them in now. If you're referencing a specific slide, feel free to type in the slide name as well. And Ben, uh, what's your hard stop tonight? Uh, I've got till eight. Okay, great. Um, I wanna ask about the cuts. You present the numbers and what needs, to, first of all, doesn't San Francisco have to have a balanced budget? Is that true? Yes. Okay. State, state, state and local governments have to be balanced, feds don't. So like, we have to figure out a way to only spend what we can spend, right? We can't go into debt. That's okay. right. So that's good to know. Do you recommend where cuts should be made? Because like, these are substantial cuts, right? We have a $12 billion budget. We have a, but with a billion dollar shortfall. I'm not great at math, but that's less than 10%, more than 5%. That's money, right? So five to 10% budget cuts across the board. How would, are you, are you, or did I get that wrong? It's close enough. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm an activist, I'm not a mathematician. Yeah. Do you suggest where or what kinds of cuts would be most productive in getting, yeah. the, getting there? Kind of my role in the government um, is basically to serve as a financial advisor to both the mayor and the board. So I'm, I'm in a political office. Um, got a, we have a two branch form of government here where the mayor and the board really make these choices. And I'm kind of a, a referee or an advisor to both, both branches in this dynamic. Um, so I play a role in the budget process. I tell people kind of, our office tells people, here's what you have to spend can't spend more, and we're a referee in that sense. Um, but then we certainly provide advice, counsel to the mayor and the board both as they're thinking about ways to bridge these gaps. And so I've had many conversations just this week with both mayor's office staff and board of supervisors about strategies, ideas, thoughts to kind of get through this. So just so I'm aware, is it like, let's just make up some numbers here. Let's say you say, okay, for the next year, you have $10 billion you can spend, not 12 billion, you got 10. And then you say, then you present them and you say, every department spent this much last, this year. And if you're gonna get to 10, everyone has to cut by, if you wanted to do across the board, everyone had to do, everyone has to reduce it by this percentage, go figure out if that's possible. Or is it more surgical where you're like, you know, this department has a really big budget. Maybe you want to cut more into this one. This one's very small and has a really large effect. Like, how do you actually make, when you get into the nitty gritty, how are you doing that? Yeah, a lot of that starts with the mayor's office. They, they issue, you know, we provide projections of what the future holds. The mayor's office then issues instructions out to 55 departments. And usually that's a starting point. And usually those starting point instructions are something like what you're talking about. Like we'd like to see ideas to cut your spending by 5% or 7%, 10%. Yeah. And then that generates a menu of ideas. And then, but the real choices get made at a much more surgical level. It wouldn't be feasible for a government as complicated as we are to kind of say you, you get 10% less. Um, it ends up being a very program by program decision and very kind of uh, with impact analysis done at a, at a much more granular level. What percentage of the budget does the mayor and board of supervisors have, actually have discretion to make cuts in? Or is it like the federal government where some things are like stuck because of rules and regulations yeah. and do they only have certain things that they can cut? It's, yeah, the, 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 there's a lot of restrictions on what the mayor and the board can change. So out of that $12 billion, we talked earlier about half of it is that left side of the part pie where money legally is required to be spent on utilities or airports. You can't take that money and spend it on parks. Um, on the $6 billion general fund side, you've got a lot of restrictions that have been put in place that make it hard even within that to make choices. So voters have adopted rules that we have to spend a certain amount of money on parks and children and seniors and affordable housing and cops and firefighters. Um, and so when you do that math, at the end of the day, you're probably left with maybe a quarter of the city budget that's really discretionary. So uh, that's like one and a half billion. That's actually discretionary. About three billion. 
A quarter of six billion is not uh, three billion. Sorry, a quarter of twelve billion. But you just said six of that is already okay. Yeah, I sorry. Quarter, listen, yeah. I'm I'm trying to follow along. I'm trying to figure it all yeah. out. Yeah. What do you think those cuts are gonna look like from the layman like myself, just walking on the street, living my life as a San Franciscan? How am I gonna feel these cuts? I don't know yet. I think a lot of that depends on you know kind of which of these economic scenarios we end up living in is it a more limited and faster recession is it a longer one yeah um i think the first steps you're going to see made are going to be the easier choices where we'll spend we'll use our reserves to to kind of take the edge off we'll reduce spending on capital programs and other one-time purposes yeah uh there will be belt tightening mayor's office has already implemented a hiring freeze you'll see a lot of that stuff and that'll get us a certain way through and then harder choices, you know, frankly, the majority of the city's discretionary general fund money is spent on public safety and public health. Mm -hmm. It's fire, police, public health, and welfare. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, if things, if we find ourselves in one of those harder scenarios and, and, and worse financial news, those are going to be the choices. What do you want to cut within that part of the world? So I'm going to ask some hard questions because I think that's, it's important to do to not waste anyone's time here. I think people probably hear the statistic that San Francisco has a budget between Latvia and Rhode Island, and they think, we're not even a city of a million people. What the hell do we, what the hell is $12 billion going to? And are our problems really so big that we have to spend more money than Latvia to solve them? Clearly, something's not being used efficiently here. And so do you think that that kind of dubiousness or concern is well-founded? And if there are major in, are, and if there are major inefficiencies, where are they? I, I don't know where you heard about Latvia and Rhode Island, but you said, um, yeah, I know. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, but you don't even have to. Use you know that, that I think everyone I, knows we have a huge budget. Like everyone knows we've got a ten, twelve billion dollar budget. I mean, yeah, it's a lot. I think a, like the I think the key thing missing from people when they throw that number around is the fact that we are the most uniquely consolidated government in the U.S. What so, so you can't pick up San Francisco and say, look, let's look at San Francisco's budget and compare it to LA city. Because LA is, we're a city and a county, we're a transit agency, we're operating an airport, we're operating a port, we're operating a water and utility system that serves San Francisco and all these other places. So that $12 billion is buying uh, services that in LA are provided by LA city budget, but they're also LA County budget. They're operated by LA Transit, which is a standalone transit agency down there. And they have a utility that's independent. And so that, like the fact that all these functions are, are lumped together here is I think a big part of that difference that makes comparisons hard. I will say though that even, even when you adjust for that and compare us like a Denver or a Honolulu or a Philadelphia, um, you know, we have, we have a wealthy tax base here in the city. Um, and we have a lot of services we provide. Um, and so e even when you adjust for the consolidation, we are a healthy government. Um, mm. Okay, so thank you for answering that question. My next question is, obviously there are a lot of cuts that are need to be made, but how do you then balance that with what are going to be pretty large spending needs as it relates to public health and also protecting and maybe even fueling small businesses who are going to have a really tough time weathering a year or year and a half long slowdown that are then looking to the city to, to help them make it through. Meaning they're going to be kind of like fires that need to be put out, hopefully not literally fires, that the city might need to employ money to, 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 to solve. So how do, you, how, how do you balance those two things? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what the next four months is going to hold. Is have, this is a, it's now not a zero-sum game. It's a less than zero-sum game, right? There's, there's less money available, and the public need has grown. And it's grown in, in new, into new places, whether that's the public health response that's required, and then responding to just tremendous new need uh, from, you know, we started, we started a uh, March with under 2% unemployment in San Francisco. We ended it with 10% unemployment. Wow. And that's going to get worse. We've got, 
what is it, almost 15,000 businesses in San Francisco that are either been told you have to entirely close or you have to be mostly closed as a result of shelter in place. You've got 20% um, of the workforce in the city is affected by the shelter in place orders. Um, and you know that that's the hard part of the budget process is we have to balance all of that and we have to do it in the next four months. Olive, my friend, you have a very tough future ahead of you and I am sure that you will rise to the occasion you already have and you'll do a great job but just friend to friend sister to sister i'm here for you if you need anything okay ben? thank you likewise right. cheers cheers to that <laughs> if you ever need if you ever want to talk just, just text me okay brad we get to we have a lot of questions let's try to get to them as quick as possible okay brad mm -hmm. asked in 2019 calpers changed their amortization policy to reduce the period over which actuarial gains and losses are amortized from 30 to 20 years Brad asks, assuming our retirement systems mimic this and market declines are sustained, um, will this have an outsized impact on other cities' budget priorities? If so, would you expect new guidance from CalPERS, CalPERS or assistance from Sacramento? A, a remarkably detailed uh, question regarding CalPERS uh, from Brad. You know, the city, actually, we actually have our own retirement system. So only about 6% of our employees are in CalPERS, which is the state's pension system. We have a, a local retirement system that is performing uh, much better than CalPERS is. Um, I do expect that our pension costs are gonna rise over the next, uh, not next year, but over the next couple of years, given market losses. Uh, the amortization period that Brad's mentioning in his question, the city's assumptions are actually are more conservative than those employed by CalPERS. Um, so I'm less concerned about CalPERS and more about um, what the health of our own local retirement system is. Got it. Okay, Akira asks if you know how many people are accessing emergency, emergency hotel services in San Francisco. And I am interviewing Trent Rohr on Monday, so that might be a question he's better. Yeah, it's probably best to Trent. It's changing every day. You know, I mentioned those targets earlier. I think we're between two and thousand, two and three thousand hotel rooms leased at this point, and I think we have um, somewhere in excess of a thousand people in those rooms right now, either that are COVID positive or under investigation, or that we have pulled in because they're at risk. So, are we paying for maybe a thousand or two thousand hotel rooms that are just sitting empty? Yes. Wait. And part part of that is this challenge of responding to what we don't know. We we need to be prepared on all fronts, right? So we need to have hotel rooms, hospital capacity, and right. all of the rest to be able to respond to what the curve might look like. Okay, Zach, can you walk me through where you got five hundred ninety million dollar rainy day fund number from? Where's the five hundred ninety million? How did we get there? Um, we have two rainy day reserves that get have gotten built up over the last 10 years. They're fed by different sources, but that's their current balance. Um, they've mostly been fed by, we have, we have reserve policies that during better times forces savings mm -hmm. um, from, from different volatile revenue sources. And, and that's what's built that balance out. Corinne asks, uh, what will be the magnitude of city layoffs? Obviously we don't know yet, but I imagine, I mean, Mayor Garcetti is talking about city, city layoffs. Is it really not something that we're thinking about seriously? Isn't it going to be required to get to this number? About half of the city's costs are our workers. Um, so unfortunately, it's hard to imagine solving for problems like we're talking about here without impacting the, the kind of cost that we have for our workforce. How we do that is, is our questions to figure out. Are those changes to the way benefits are paid for? Are they changes to wages that are paid? Are they furloughs? Are they layoffs? Yeah. How much can we get done with the hiring freeze? All those choices are still there. Got it. Question, which is a version of my earlier one, but I think it, it, it's a little, another take on it that I think it's interesting. Ben, how might one household or business feel these losses and cuts? Can you explain an example of that trickle down impacting the business or home even past the immediate crisis? I think this is what a lot of people are wondering, Ben. They're trying, they're hearing yeah. these, these numbers are scary sounding, but we don't really know what it means, you know? Yeah, and I, I, I hate to duck it, but I think a lot of that are gonna be the choices that, that come. Um, those are the choices that are faced, the city faces in the next four months. 
Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a way to contextualize $1.7 billion if it, yeah. if it I helped. Don't, I don't that, that, that's, that's more than we spend on our entire health system here in the city. It's about 30 rec and park departments. We spend about $50 million on street cleaning elite year. We spend about 15 million on street trimming or tree trimming. Mm -hmm. um, like you have to put a lot of these building blocks together to get to a number that yeah. fits. A lot of people are asking if these slides are gonna be available. They are at your disposal, Manny. All right. I will send them to everyone who's registered for this call. So yeah, what are the emergency spending requirements? What are the priorities? Is this something you're privy to? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, so kind of the immediate cost the city is incurring are really in a few different care areas. There, we talked about hotels, and that and hotels changes in shelter um, services at SROs. That's for people that can't shelter in place during this moment. So that's a one big bucket. The biggest single bucket is planning for the healthcare, the healthcare system itself at this moment, being ready for a potential surge on our hospitals, having adequate equipment. That's another big cost. And then there's a lot of miscellaneous costs associated with just the city flexing so quickly to deliver services differently, telecommuting, muni expenses, all of that stuff. So I think those are the three big, three big buckets of cost that we're incurring. Got it. David is dialing in from New York City. David, hello. Sending you strength. New York City, we, we pray for you. The real estate dynamics are different in this recession from typical ones. David is curious about the mechanisms by which property taxes are expected to decrease. Is this driven by people's inability to pay, Ben? Yeah, no, I, you know, the, the city deferred its collection of property taxes by about a month. So we're going to get paid a little bit later, but that's less the financial impact, I think, at the moment than how much value is San Francisco's real estate going to lose through this? Because mm -hmm. um, that's really what will drive what we get paid. And I, you know, among the different impacts within the property tax base, I think the ho hotels are clearly going to suffer huge losses in the value of their property. And I, I think it's interesting to think about the losses that commercial office space is going to feel coming out of a world where we all have been telecommuting and get more used to telecommuting and potentially telecommute for a while. Yeah. Jay's got a question. Ben, we have so many questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, people, but I'm going to try to get to most of them. Ben, have you identified any big buckets of money from the federal government that might help uh, help offset offset your projected deficit? Yes, we've got uh, within the CARES Act. There's probably 17 different revenue streams that should flow in some form to the city. Right. We're trying to figure out what value of those is going to flow and how we can use it. There's almost a big puzzle to put together with all of the federal money to to figure out how much of these costs that we're incurring we can offset. So yes, I think federal stimulus will help reduce the deficit. Um, Susanna, if I understand, oh, I have questions about that, but about politics and whether Joe Biden, you think Joe Biden would help us more, but we'll pause on it. We'll put a pin in, in Joe, not an actual pin. You get it. Susanna, if I understand correctly, some of the earmarks for the general fund have recession escape clauses. Were those written in such a way that the mayor and supervisors will have a little more discretion this year and next? Susanna, you know your you know what you're talking about. You know your homework. Yeah. yeah. Damn. A, a baseline academic. Yes, yeah. we have uh, recession triggers in a couple of the recently adopted uh, voter adopted set asides. Baselines, those will take a little pressure off. It'll be in the the millions or maybe the low tens of millions. Got it. Uh, that'll help with. Pip squeak which I presume is not your actual name, but maybe it is. Do you know if the board has the ability to propose emergency taxes or levies right now outside of what would have to be approved by voters? Yeah, there is, you know, voter, no. The, the, board, the board of supervisors and mayor cannot increase taxes in California and we all should blame ourselves for, for that dynamic. It's Prop 13 and Prop 218. So the voters need to approve any tax increase there's an election in November, this November, where the voters could consider a tax increase. Got it. Anthony, um, and I'm gonna, while you answer this, I'm going to leave for a second and come right back. 
Anthony asks what kind of planning and coordination on economic and financial recovery is happening across Bay Area cities and counties. So can you talk about regional solution making? I'll be right back. Sure. Um, so there's kind of nation economic recovery planning happening in San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland at the moment. Um, the city has formed an economic recovery task force. Their first meeting is this Friday. It includes a cross set of our elected leadership, business leadership, workers, unions, labor. <clears throat> uh, there's similar efforts starting up in San Jose and Oakland. Um, there has been some initial contact between those groups, but it hasn't kind of fully coalesced yet. Uh, the three big city mayors in the Bay Area, uh, Oakland, San Francisco, and San Jose are in regular contact. And I think that's really where the primary conversation has started thus far. I think there'll be a, you know, we're still getting our arms under, or our legs under us related to the emergency. And I think the, the discussion about recovery is gonna pick up here very quickly in the moment. Um, I'll just on that, are you like having like conference calls with all the other controllers of the major cities? Uh, conference calls, emails, CFOs, controllers, others from the big 20 cities, yeah, often. Who's dealing with the, the biggest mishmash right now? Oh, I mean, we, our, our hearts should all go out for New York City right now. Yeah. Um, Zach. Zach is a physical therapist at uh, Zuckerberg General. Um, the city is fortunate to have hundreds of millions of dollars in general, fudge, general fund budget reserves. Mm -hmm. um, how will the city use these reserves and to protect cities, the vital city services, including public health? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the city built reserves to when times were better um, and they should get spent now. I mean, they're, they're here for this purpose, they won't get spent just in this one year, they'll get spent over the next couple, but reserves should get spent. Benjamin says, you seem so chill and relaxed. Certainly he's not talking about me. What, do you, what are you doing to keep yourself grounded and sane in the midst of this crisis? It's a good question. I'm glad I seem chill, relaxed and sane, but I don't know that I'm fully any of those things right now. Um, daily walks with my family help. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, a blocked out time on my calendar every day for a nice walk. That's well, you do seem chill and relaxed and all that. Are there any, I think I actually got to the bottom. Oh, TJ Fisher. This is a little bit of a political question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, do you have an opinion about the muni fare increases announced today? Where do you think the line is between raising revenue for a distressed city service, which I talked to Jeff last week, um, and raising fees to a point that may impact the use of that service in the future. TJ, great question. Yeah. It's a hard one. I don't know what to do. Um, I think, I mean, there's so many places where the way public services in San Francisco are going to come out of this looking a little bit different and it are going to be impacted in transit is one of the huge ones you think about it. I mean, the, the shape of what transit service looks like in a world where we're afraid, at least in the short term, to be physically close to each other, um, is it's such, a, it's such a hard model to figure out how that needs to look different um, three months from now, 12 months from now. Um, it feels so important from the econo in an economic perspective and an environmental perspective and others, but you, I, I do worry about kind of the like very significant change potentially in demand on our public transit system. Um, I, you know, that, that's not an answer to the question of whether fares should go up a little bit or go down a little bit at the moment. I think we should be worried more fundamentally about, about transit as a whole and how it gets funded and how, and how we support it. I mean, it does, you know, uh, it does feel like the consumer of these conversations, you're thinking like, you, you have to believe that there are ways in which agencies, departments, governments can save money that affect the San Francisco residents. And there are ways that they can make those decisions that affect them less, right? And affect the agency more. And I think it's clear that I'm talking about things like salaries and pensions and- yeah. 
I mean, I don't think there's a lot of, I know this because we went through, I'm in the office of small business. I'm a small business commissioner. And we went through this budget process ourselves. The mayor, before all this, we had to look at cuts. And I was like, all right, let's see. All right, I get to look inside, you know, what a budget is of a city department. It's a small one. Like, let's see where all the fat is to trim. And it was like, there was like, it didn't seem like there was a lot of fat. And like, there was like, no, there was like a tiny little office supplies budget. It was like nothing. Like, so it seems like it's mostly all salaries. And but then, you know, then you, then you, then you read today's story about DPW spending a hundred thousand dollars on hats or whatever. And you're like, ugh, it makes you lose confidence a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the exercise is belt tightening, cut everything you can live without, um, do everything you can to minimize the impact on public services. And, but I, I just, I know from experience, that's not going to be enough to get through this. There, there will be harder choices at the end of it. And at the end of the day, um, I don't think if, if, if the city is working well, um, things that are good for the department are good for the public. And hold on, if the city is working well, things that are good for the department are good for the public. Okay. And vice versa. There's, there's, it's, it's kind of a false dichotomy, I think, to say, like, let's cut things the public cares about, public service. That, that minimize public service cuts, let's just cut those other things. Well, those other things are what make public service possible. And at some point- Meaning, um, meaning like, you know, meaning creating a financial infrastructure for city staff that makes them work well and work hard and get the best and the brightest? Yeah, sure. For example, I mean, I, I don't doubt that we're gonna have a conversation about how, how much city employees are gonna get paid and what their benefits are. Um, but that's directly related to public service that we're able to provide. The, 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 the pay and benefits we provide to our workforce allows us to recruit people of talent that can provide services that we all rely on. And so to put one in one bucket and, and another in another bucket and say, cut that one and not that one, it's-, it's I'm not saying this is how I feel. I'm saying that I I'm trying to channel the San Francisco <laughs> public right now. And you know, yep. you, you, all we do is we read the news. There's only like one or two newspapers in our damn city and they have a hold on it. And then we, and then we ride the Muni and we walk the streets and we're like, wait a second. Yep. You know, Joe Smith is being paid $350,000 to run this department, but the things this department is supposed to be doing don't seem to be working so well. Why are they being paid $350,000? I don't know anyone being paid $350,000. So something's not right here. And so that's just what we consume. And I know it's yeah. more complicated than that. Well, and finding, that, finding those bad examples are important. They're always important. They're especially important right now. Because are, you, are you hearing this outside your window too? Not yet. It's not going to your corner? No, it's not going to my corner. It's eight o'clock. The entire, this whole side of the Castro explodes at eight o'clock with people cheering. I'm, I can hear it remotely a couple okay. blocks over. It's, it's raucous over here. Hey, Ben, I'm gonna let you go in a second. I just wanna say to you, um, and I said this when you came to Manny's last time, how lucky I think our city is to have you. You are one of those people in our city government that somehow remarkably is loved by everyone um, and beloved by everyone. And I think it is because of, I forgot whose comment it was, you were able to proceed in this role with a cool, calm collectedness, at least, a perception of it that is really needed, needed now more than ever. Uh, we, need, we need Ben Rosenfield at his best now more than ever. And I think, and I think we've got him and we're lucky. Um, thank, you. thank you, Manny. Very nice. My pleasure. To those who are tuned in, I would like to make a ask of you at this eight o'clock hour. If you're not already a sponsor of Manny's, please go to joinit.org slash o slash Manny's and help my small business make it through this very difficult time for us. Manny's is a venue and a gathering space, and this is exactly the kind of space that's gonna probably have a really tough time making it through this long recovery. And so the only way we're gonna be able to do it is with a community of individuals helping us do it and supporting us. It's $36 a month. It's gonna go straight to keeping us open. Um, and I really, really ask all of you who are able to go to joinit.org slash o slash Manny's and become a sponsor. It's also in the chat link, so you can just click the link. You can cancel anytime. If things get tough for you in a couple months, you can just cancel it. But 
Um, it's the kind of thing that'll really help right now. So please do consider becoming a sponsor. The link, like I said, is in the chat box. I also wanna thank my amazing team that's been working so hard to make all this happen. It's Jupiter, Sam, and Ram to my right, I think. Um, so thank you to my team for doing this. Thank you all for tuning in, being active and engaged participants in our body politic and in our community. And finally, the most important person to thank is Ben Rosenfield for steering our city and stewarding it in this time of need. So thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. All right, good night and thanks for the time. Have a good night, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.